Hello students and welcome to this new series on sports nutrition in which we are going to talk about what is sport, what are the different activities we can find and how we can change our nutrition to get a better performance. In this first video we are going to talk about the bioenergetics as well as the adaptive response we can find in exercise. Hi, I'm Tommy. I'm a human nutrition student and researcher at the university. What I do in this type of videos is to synthesize my classes so then I can explain and teach you the best and most valuable information you need to know. So let's start this video by talking about the bioenergetics of exercise. So bioenergetics of exercise. You have to know that physical activity, of course, increases energy demands in the body. And from where we can get that energy? Well, we have the metabolic pathways that can generate ATP, which are free mainly. Anaerobic and lactic, the phosphocreatine. Anaerobic lactic, in which we use glucose to create a lactic acid and then uh, glucose again for the core cycle. And aerobic, using glucose, fatty acids, oxidation, using the Krebs cycle, indeed. And the order of priority is first the phosphocreatine, then the lactic, and then the oxidation using the Krebs cycle. So what are the processes that consume ATP in the muscle? Well, the first one is the major one, the actomyosin ATPase. This is crucial for muscle contraction and indeed it uses 70% of that created ATP. Then we have the calcium ATPase pump. Without calcium, you cannot contract our muscles. So as you can see, it's very important as well. And then we also have the sodium potassium ATPase pump, which is always active in pretty much every cell we have. So you have to know that after a rise in lactic acid, after a competition, for example, after a training, returning to normal levels of lactic acid is faster with light exercise rather than stopping completely. And that's why a lot of athletes run a little bit more after the marathon, for example. And this is done to stimulate the creation of glucose from that lactic acid, because the liver can send glucose to the bloodstream, but muscles can't. So the lactic acid goes to the liver it creates glucose again and it sends it back to the bloodstream. And now we have to talk about the respiratory exchange ratio. This is basically the difference between the volume of CO2 created divided by the oxygen levels we have. So when R is 1, it means that we are using 100% glucose as an energy source. And this is probably the anaerobic lactic in which we use glucose or the first part of the aerobic in which we use only glucose. When we deplete our glycogen stores, so we use all the glucose in our body, we start using fatty acids. And we can see that the respiratory exchange ratio, the R, goes from 1 to 0 0.7, in which we use 100% fatty acids. In reality, this mechanism is not one or the other. It's a mix between the two. And you have to know that fatty acids metabolism can't normally go beyond 60% of VO2 max. So they create more ATP per molecule, but the performance tends to be lower. And amino acid metabolism starts when the carbohydrates are finished, are over. And we can check this by using a urea sweat measurement. If there is a lot of urea in our sweat, then we're using amino acids as an energy source to create glucose. And alanine glucose pyruvate is the mechanism we have to create the glucose from amino acids. So what is the integration of the different metabolic pathways? Well, when we have more than 50% of anaerobic metabolism, that's considered anaerobic exercise. So this one right here, in which we use phosphocreatine or glycolysis, creating lactic acid. In this state, glucose consumption is 13 times more than in aerobic metabolism. So there is a six times faster ATP production compared to the aerobic metabolism. And we create 38 to 39 molecules of ATP per glucose molecule. At higher intensity, we use more glucose and less fat. We use more anaerobic fast white fibers. On the other hand, when we have uh, more than 50% of aerobic metabolism, then it is considered aerobic exercise. And this starts around 30 seconds of the exercise. Yes, because the phosphocreatine lasts for 5 to 10 seconds, then the anaerobic glycolysis in which we create lactic acid lasts for 25 seconds. And after that, the 30 seconds, we enter the aerobic metabolism. So again, fat oxidation only between 55 and 75% of VO2 max, depending on training and diet, of course. And ideally, we want to increase that VO2 max percentage at which we can use fat as fuel. So we are going to preserve our glucose for later. If one knows how to use fat properly, 
one ends up using glucose better. So at higher duration, more fat is used and less glucose. More aerobic, slow red fibers. Now let's take a look at the fundamentals of exercise physiology. The concepts of exercise, physical activity and sport. They are very similar, but they are not the same. Physical activity is every activity that involves muscle contraction and increases the energy consumption of the individual. So for example, walking to university is considered physical activity. Exercise, on the other hand, is a physical activity with a purpose. So for example, to improve health, lose weight, etc. This is, for example, going to the gym. And sport is when exercise becomes competitive and it involves a program to increase performance. As you can see, competition. There are different types of exercise, as you know. So we can differentiate between resistance training with weights and endurance training, for example, running, and also between the continuous and interval training. Physical fitness is a multidimensional concept related with physical activity. The components are related with the discipline and also related with health. And here we have to differentiate some factors. For example, the cardiorespiratory resistance. This is how much can you run? The strength and muscle resistance. How much can you lift? Flexibility. This is high in women. And that's because men are more tight because of higher muscle and body composition as well. It's related with osteopenia and sarcopenia. So bone loss and muscle loss. And you have to know that there is this MET, which is the metabolic equivalent of task. This is measurement of oxygen consumption in a certain activity. With these METs, we can calculate the energy expenditure of a certain task. And we are going to see that in the next video. On the other hand, we have the acute adaptive response to exercise. Aerobic metabolism mainly. This involves cardiovascular and respiratory system together. And the failure of one will stop the muscle contraction due to lack of oxygen. So let's view the cardiovascular first. Cardiovascular control center. This is to regulate blood pressure at demand. And this is done using baroreceptors, chemoreceptors and mechanoreceptors we have in the body. So during exercise, we increase the blood pressure. To provide blood and indeed oxygen to the tissues. During aerobic exercise, there is an increase in systolic, but diastolic stays constant. Systolic is the ejection of blood from the heart, and diastolic is the filling. During anaerobic exercise, both rise. When we have arm exercises, we have an increased heart rate, increased pressure, and there is a leg vasoconstriction due to peripheral resistance. On the other hand, when we have a leg exercise, this is mainly for coronary patients. And there is a vasodilation of the legs and there is a higher venous return, which is beneficial for them. So the blood flow during exercise, it increases in the leg muscle as well as in the heart, skin and lungs. It stays the same in the brain because it cannot lower and it lowers in the spachnic, which means the digestive system, as well as in the kidneys and the inactive muscle. So as you can see, we provide more blood to the muscles we use, the heart, the skin and lungs. We cannot talk about the cardiovascular system without mentioning the cardiac output, which is the flow of blood times frequency. And at higher heart rate, there is a higher intensity, as well as when we have a higher stroke volume per beat equals higher intensity, but up to 40 to 60% of the cardiac output. Why? Because we have this thing called cardiovascular drift. This happens when there is a lower stroke volume due to a lower plasmatic volume. And to compensate that lower stroke volume, we increase the heart rate to maintain the cardiac output. So lower stroke volume, higher heart rate, same cardiac output. On the other hand, we have the respiratory. This is to in increase the ventilation. What are the factors that increase the ventilation? Well, the pH because of lactic acid, the temperature, warmth, and the neurogenic factor. This is response to movement. The aim is to remove body heat and we do that with a higher body surface area and at higher intensity we have a higher ventilatory equivalent. The ventilatory threshold is related to the lactate threshold. The ventilatory threshold is the ventilatory and metabolic CO2 increase whereas the lactic threshold has to do with lactate. That means that an increase in lactic acid will increase as well the CO2 in the blood and higher lactate higher ventilation because there is a compensation and the ventilation rises immediately as the blood lactate rises a little. This is to compensate. Lactate creates a metabolic acidosis which is compensated with a respiratory alkalosis. And here we have the graph of 
blood lactate and VATS, which is the intensity of the exercise. So the first point here is the respiratory threshold point in which we increase the CO2. And this is the lactate threshold. And the second one is the respiratory compensation point, which has to do with the acidosis, which is the anaerobic threshold. Acidosis means that we start to use the glucose to convert it into lactate and we produce this acidosis. And as you can see, the blood lactate starts to increase a lot. And this is a concept called hyperpnea, which is the involuntary increase in respiration. And a higher tidal volume equals higher respiratory rate. And the maximum oxygen consumption is limited by the cardiac output. Because of this equation, the oxygen consumption equals the cardiac output times the arteriovenous oxygen difference. So the difference between arterial oxygen and venous oxygen. The tidal volume is only one of four volumes we have during a respiration because we also have the inspiratory reserve volume, the tidal volume, the expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume. And there is always a functional respiratory reserve, the residual one. This is used as a safety mechanism. And now that we know what is the acute adaptive response to training, let's take a look at the long-term one. So we suffer task-specific adaptations. It is important to train in the right energy requirement. And here there are some concepts to take in account. Overload is the intensity, the duration, or the frequency of training. Specificity is the type of overload. And here we have to mention the SAID, specific adaptations to impose demands. This basically means that we have to individualize and that the response to training also has a genetic component. So that's why some people are good at swimming, others are good at running. So during aerobic training, the goals are to increase the cardiorespiratory capacity and to increase the capacity to consume oxygen in the muscles, which are two different things. And you have to know that in muscles, we have different types of fibers. We have the endurance types and the explosiveness type. So depending on which ones we are going to train, we are going to develop more endurance or explosiveness. And during training, we use glucose first and then fat. Let's take a look at adaptations then. So cardiovascular first, we have the eccentric hypertrophy of the heart in which we have a higher beat volume and a lower heart rate at rest. This equals to an increase in the cardiac output. The end diastolic minus the end systolic volume equals the beat volume. And the speed of recovery of normal heart rate is faster in elite athletes. So they take less time to get back to normal. Another thing that also happens is that there is an increase in capillaries in the active muscle. And this is done to get a better oxygen extraction. Indeed, a higher vascularized muscle will lower the speed of the blood flow, increasing the oxygen to the muscle, the oxygen extraction to the muscles. And extraction at higher flow is a merit, which indeed you're very lucky if you're able to extract oxygen at a higher speed, at a higher blood flow. That's a significant advantage. On the other hand, we have the ventilatory adaptations. This is to increase the maximum ventilatory volume. So when we create an adaptation to our training regime, we have a lower expiratory volume divided by the VO2 max. Then there is a higher threshold lactate volume, as well as a lower respiratory work. So we make less effort to obtain the same result. And the lactate threshold is higher. So it takes longer to produce lactate. And we can preserve that glycogen for later. An increase in the VO2 max is always correlated with a higher intensity of training. And in normal people, the anaerobic threshold is at 40 to 60% of the VO2 max. The anaerobic threshold is when we start to create lactate from glucose because there are higher demands due to the exercise. And we have to create ATP much faster. Remember, ATP creation is 13 times faster with anaerobic lactic metabolism. And in elite athletes, this threshold can even reach the 90% of VO2 max. So they can oxidize glucose at 90% of VO2 max. And in that last part of the competition in which they reach levels higher than 90% of VO2 max, they start to generate the lactate. That means they preserved a lot of glycogen and they will have more energy than you in the last part. So what's the condition in principle? This is basically that you can adapt to whatever exercise you do using cardiovascular and ventilatory adaptation. But this can be reversible and is called deconditioning. And it's also related to injuries, indeed. During deconditioning, we have a loss in strength and power leading to atrophy. 
especially if there is a completely immobilization. And this affects endurance athletes way more than anaerobic or resistance training athletes, because endurance is lost more easily and takes longer to recover due to lower redox enzymes. So it's more difficult to recover if you are an endurance training athlete. Okay, this is it for this video. I hope you understood everything I said. If you didn't, there is a comment section down below. Don't forget to like, subscribe and turn on the notifications so you get notified every time I upload a new video. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one in which we're going to talk about the caloric expenditure and thermogenesis. So I will see you there. Hope you enjoyed.